What if there was a technology that allowed us to teleport the contents of our minds across time and space directly into someone else's brain? That worked across huge distances that could send our thoughts into the future, yet was so simple a child could use it. Such a marvel, of course, already exists. It's not the internet or mobile phones, but an ancient technology. One that's at least 5,000 years old. The technology of writing. Writing is something that most of us do every day without stopping to think about it. But if you do stop and think about it, you realise that what you are doing is quite magical. You are taking the thoughts from inside your head and putting them out into the world in a form where another human mind can understand them. Even if they are thousands of miles away, or perhaps centuries in the future. In this series, I want to explore this transformative technology the different scripts that can turn spoken language into visual form, the varying methods we have used to put words on a page, and the way that changing the way we write has changed the course of history. And the first question is about the origin of writing. Did it develop in different times in different places? Or do all the scripts we see around us share a single common root? And if that is the case, then where and how did it all begin? And who began it? Egypt, the Saqqara Funerary Complex near Cairo. In 2300 BC, what today looks like a hill of sand was the pyramid tomb of Pharaoh Teti. Inside the tomb, Egyptologist Yasmin El Shazli took me to see something extraordinary. They're pretty impressive, aren't they? They really are. Yeah. The walls of Teti's tomb were carved with thousands of stylized pictures. But this was not decoration. This is the earliest known complete uh, text, ancient Egyptian text. Just beautiful. These pictures are hieroglyphs, a writing system older than the pyramids themselves. And what do they say? They are spells that help resurrect the king in the afterlife. If you know how to read them, you can find the king's name repeated again and again in every incantation. Oh, oh, rise up, O oh Teti. Take your head, collect your bones. Gather your limbs, shake the earth from your flesh. Take your bread that rots not, your beer that sours not. Stand at the gates that bar the common people. Rise up, O Teti. You shall not die. Wow. Oh, there's so much writing. Yes, these are all magic spells mm -hmm. designed to resurrect the king mm -hmm. so he could live forever mm -hmm. in the afterlife. 
the fact that his name is still there made him, in a sense, immortal. We're speaking about him right now. And the ancient Egyptians realized that. They realized that the written word had so much power and that by writing your name, you became immortal. You immortalized yourself. Hieroglyphs are indeed magic. They may not raise the dead, but like all writing, they allow them to speak. Writing is one of the few things that all societies do. Everybody uses a pen or a brush, and with that we can express all of our thoughts, record all of our information, study the stars, and compose poems, and write letters to each other. So writing binds humanity together practically more than any other activity. Today we take it for granted but the creation of writing is the event which gave humanity a history. When you scrutinize what happened, it is actually very dramatic in one important sense, what uh, we like to call in our department the giant leap for mankind. Am Anfang steht der Versuch, die Welt in Begriffen und Bildern zu erfassen. So funktioniert Denken. Writing always starts with pictures and then it becomes a little bit more complicated. And that's how you develop into a purely alphabetic system later on. How did our ancestors conceive of writing? How did they learn to make pictures speak? And how did those pictures eventually become the letters we use today? As I discovered, the answer to those questions can only be found in an archaeology of the human mind. Writing is a recent innovation. Our species has existed for about 300,000 years, and for all but the last 5,000 of them, people had to record and transmit vital knowledge without the aid of writing. Some cultures still do. In the Northern Territory of Australia, Yedumdama Bilhani, an elder of the Waterman people, is singing an ancient song about the creation of the world. Song line trail that I made it happening all the way right back from the beginning of everything to people to people to people to all the way right from brilliant, brilliant years ago to million years that come down hundred years and now now come back to write a place. And we know all the song now. That's why we never throw that creation song away. We still got it there today. What kind of knowledge? is in those songs. In a song line trail, there's the knowledge that is given you from the old people, you know what they call a song line trail, the naming all the different sites, the plant, tree, mountain, water off, and all that. And so it's like a map? Like a map. It is a map in your mind, but all links up. So break it here? Yeah, 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 like this. So you just got to put the fingernail on it. Yeah. And you gotta go like Meeting this. Bill, I was impressed by the richness and complexity of Aboriginal culture. Handed down orally for probably tens of thousands of years without the need to write anything down. That's how you get on. That's amazing. Yeah. And that raised a fundamental question about writing. Why did our ancestors feel the need for it? What prompted them to start recording things, not for the ear, but for the eye? Images are important, indeed sacred, in Aboriginal culture. And before I was allowed to see them, Bill needed to introduce me to the ancestors.
Karena bangun mengajak bulan. Kalian kawuyan. Ya. Yeah. Karena ngajin dulu aku. Thank you. I said how the spiritual people call out, I brought you strange here to, to welcome them. I got a young lady here called Bangbun is a lady, and he's here. I got him. He's happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is Kandawakcha, the moon rock. As we talked, it quickly became clear that Bill's way of thinking about images was quite different to mine. While we're standing here now, this one, what they call the moon dream in sight. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's half moon. Yeah. Well, that's it in there. Yeah. What about when he was a human, he was called Jabali. Like Jabali. Us. Jabali. He's up in the sky. Yeah. Now, he, now he's here now he's on, the the on, the, on the rock. In the rock. Yeah. In the Warderman creation story, all the plants and animals of the world were once people, the Warderman's ancestors, wandering across a formless, muddy land until the creation dog let out a mighty howl. When he sang out, like this, the dog, the one that sounded, made everything change. He changed the whole world. And this country now, well, from the soft high mountain become a rock, and all these people become a tree, and changed all the different animals, kangaroos, dingoes, whatever you can make it, lizards, or snakes, and all. As the mud hardened, some of the ancestors passed into the rock, leaving traces of that moment of creation. That was a mud, and people come along put his foot there. See? And that's what it is there. He was in the mud, now he's in the rock. The human footprint, the human there. There's a dog here. And there's all the human footprint, all over, you can see it. Then the shadow of the old moon, they went into all of the rock as well, showing the creation down. When I see an image, I naturally think of it as a representation, a picture of something. But to Bill, these are not pictures of the ancestors, these are the ancestors gone into the rock. Bill's song about the ancestors is also addressed to them. But he has to rely on memory. These images, powerful as they are, cannot tell him which words to use. In order for images to do that, they would have to gain a new power, the power of representation. They made a big song line from west to east. <laughs> Cairo's Egyptian Museum is crammed with thousands of objects excavated from the tombs of ancient Egypt. One of the very oldest was discovered by Gunter Dreyer in the 1990s at a dig in the city of Abydos. It's a clay vase which predates the first pharaoh by many centuries. It was made 5,700 years ago. And it seems to use imagery in a new way. Bei der Reinigung stellte sich heraus, dass es auf sehr interessante Weise dekoriert ist. Es zeigt in der Mitte ein großes Rechteck, das in kleinere Rechtecke unterteilt ist. Und links und rechts davon Zickzacklinien. Und ich glaube, es handelt sich dabei um eine Darstellung Ägyptens. Gunther believes that the vase is decorated with a stylized representation of the distinctive geography of the Nile Valley. Egyptians have always lived on the land immediately adjacent to the Nile, where irrigation ditches can bring river water to the fields. Ancient Egyptian life was largely confined to this narrow strip of green, 
the desert highlands on either side was where the dead were buried. Das große Rechteck unterteilt in kleine Felder zeigt das bewässerte Land. Und links und rechts des Niltales befinden sich Berge. So, these lines represent something, something that is not present. It's a conceptual revolution in the meaning of a picture. And if a picture can represent a thing, it can represent a word. Bis zur Schrift ist es noch ein weiter Weg. Aber die in solchen Darstellungen entwickelten, vereinfachten, ikonhaften Bilder werden später als Schriftzeichen verwendet. But what was it that made people want to represent words in visual form? Five thousand years ago, Egypt lay at one end of a zone of cultivation called the Fertile Crescent. At the other end lay Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. In both places, people had learned how to irrigate the land to increase food production. That meant that not everyone had to work the land and a more complex society could develop. Irving Finkel from the British Museum is an expert on Mesopotamia and the region's first civilization, Sumer. To set the scene, it's important to understand that in Mesopotamia, the Sumerians had what we call city-states, independent walled entities with a large population, farmers all around, administrators, a central temple, and so forth. And it is in those uh, enclaves of so-called civilization that the need was, I think, first felt for some kind of record-keeping what we've got in front of us is a very small handful of pieces of clay with writing on called cuneiform writing. Yes. And we have in our department a huge collection of 130,000 of them. So I thought if they were all here, you'd become <laughs> di giddy and dizzy and perhaps even fall asleep. So um, Overwhelmed anyway. Exactly. Shall we start with this? So yeah. that's the oldest of these ones. It is. Do you have an approximate date? It's probably about 2,900 BC, wow. something like so that. 5,000 years old. Something like that. And the thing about it is, you can see it's a very orderly piece of work because it's ruled into columns, and these yeah. round things and half round things are numerals, and at the back there's a big total where all the numbers are added up, and this is a sign for barley, which indicates uh. that it's some kind of way. You can see yeah. that this is an ear of barley Absolutely. in a pictographic kind of form. Yes. And Originally, the writing began in a pictographic form, what we call pictographic form, which means that people produced, the scribes produced little drawings of whatever they were talking about, mm -hmm. the animals and plants and things like this. So it's a very primitive level of writing, but it's very ancient, and it actually exemplifies probably why writing came into existence in the first place, because... It's a document which is concerned with wages. Yes. And people argue that this script came out of the requirement for complicated administration of this kind where written records became necessary. But anybody who works for the Inland Revenue will be proud to feel <laughs> that that was their striking contribution to the progress of mankind. So what I was holding in my hands was the distant ancestor of today's spreadsheet a grid of boxes with symbols that represent numbers and pictures that represent commodities. But the language of accountancy is limited. Eventually, the distinctive wedge-shaped writing called cuneiform that developed in Mesopotamia would be capable of representing the full richness of Sumerian and the other languages of the region. It would be used to write great epics, recount ghost stories and tell jokes. But as Irving explained, to make pictographic signs speak in this way would take another great conceptual leap. You could go quite a long way with these simple signs, but the giant leap came when somebody conceived of this matter, that you could draw a picture which represented something that someone could recognise, but at the same time, 
that sign could be used just for the sound of the thing it looked like, so that the sound became um, drawn out of or separated from the picture. So on this tablet here, there is an ear of barley. Now the word for barley in Sumerian is, is pronounced like sheh. So your Sumerian sees this and says, ah, sheh, barley. But at the same time, this scribe or a fellow scribe in writing a totally different kind of document could use this sign not to mean barley, but just to write the sound of share. And this giant leap is something rather simple, and it's something which could have occurred to a child, but nevertheless, it is of great lasting significance. Using a picture to represent a sound in this way is called the Reber's Principle, and it makes it possible to spell out words using pictures. To give a really clear example, there's a word shega in Sumerian, which means beautiful or pretty or, or, or nice or something like that. And so a scribe would write it syllabically, shega. So he would use this sign, the barley sign, for the she bit. And then he'd have to write ga for the second bit. As it happens, ga means milk. So he would draw the picture which represented milk. And barley and milk together would spell shega, which had nothing to do with either barley or milk. So this is a kind of rebus writing. Rebus is a smart word for it. It's really a pun in some senses. It's a kind of pun that you get another meaning out of a sign. At the other end of the Fertile Crescent, Egyptians too started to make rebus puns. Compelling evidence of this comes from an extraordinary object in Cairo's Egyptian museum, the Nama palette, carved in 3000 BC. Die Palette vermittelt eine historische Nachricht, nämlich über einen Sieg des Königs Nama über die Unterägypter, die Delta-Leute. By conquering the Nile Delta, Nama took control of the river all the way to the sea becoming the first pharaoh of a unified Egyptian state. The palette tells the story entirely through pictures. Sie zeigt den König Nama, der einen Feind erschlägt. Nach dem Sieg gab es offenbar eine große Siegesfeier. Der König tritt auf mit Gefolge und sie besichtigen die Strecke der erschlagenen Feinde. Diese Feinde sind zum einen gefesselt Sie sind geköpft, man hat ihnen die Köpfe zwischen die Beine gelegt und sogar die Falli abgeschnitten und zum Teil auf ihre Köpfe draufgelegt. Diese Feinde waren völlig erledigt. But next to the main characters in this grisly tale are seemingly random pairs of images, such as a catfish and a chisel. They only make sense in light of the Rebus principle. Der Wels und der Meißel stehen als Lautwerte für den Namen des Königs. The Egyptian word for catfish is nar. A chisel is mer. When combined, they sound out narma. The name of the first of the pharaohs. Next to his defeated enemy is the symbol for a harpoon, war in Egyptian. Below it is a rectangle, similar to the ones on the Abydos bars. Und das kleine Feld bewässertes Land, das wir schon von dem prädynastischen Tongefäß kennen, für den Lautwert Sch. Zu lesen ist der Name Wasch. Man sieht damit, dass man neue Möglichkeiten der Schrift, die sonst nur in der Verwaltung verwendet wurde, ausschöpfte und benutzte, um nun auch bildliche Darstellungen klar zu machen, so dass Betrachter sie lesen konnten. The next step was to extend the Rebus principle, which on the palette is used to spell names to the full vocabulary of the Egyptian language. The script the Egyptians created in this way rivals cuneiform for the prize of being the world's first true writing system. Hieroglyphs. Orly Goldwasser has made them a lifetime study. Orly, 
Hello, lovely to see you. you. <laughs> How are you? Great. Hey. When I'm here, it's great. What have we got here then? What do you think it is? Well, it's certainly a text. I don't know which way How to do read you know it. It's text. It's all pictures. Stylized. Yeah. With what else repetitions. Might... Yeah. There's obviously a certain ordering. The, the, the sizes. Oh, sizes is very important. You see, everything is actually on the same size. People, mm -hmm. birds, houses, snakes, hands. A hand of, of a person and the whole person is of the same size. So this gives your mind immediately an order. Lydia, you are not in picture reading, but in script reading. Mm. This is the greatest experiment ever conducted to write language in pictures only, only pictures. It's an enormous cognitive effort to read it or to write it, but it's fantastic. What makes hieroglyphs so difficult is that the scribes used thousands of symbols and the rebus means that most of them have at least two quite distinct meanings. If we are talking about a duck, as you see it here, it can be a representation of a duck, and this is fine, this is easy. But in many other cases, he's not a duck at all. He's just the sound of the duck, so. For example, the word daughter is Sot, or something like that. We don't know exactly how to pronounce that. So for the so, we have our dear duck. And afterwards, we put another sign, something that looks like a small half French bread, you see it? Cut French bread, which gives the meaning t. So, sot. The rebus principle was the key that unlocked writing for the peoples of the Fertile Crescent. With pictures that spoke, rulers could write the history of their reigns, draw up legal codes, administer far-flung empires, and build monuments that still impress us today. The rebus is among the most consequential intellectual innovations of all time. So who discovered it? True writing starts when the sounds of a language are represented. And that, I think, was first developed in Egypt. And of course, there's a bit of a scroll between um, Egyptologists and Assyriologists about who invented writing. And of course, we did, the important thing to clarify. So, was the rebus born in Egypt, or Mesopotamia, or somewhere else entirely? The National Library of China. I came here to see examples of another ancient script, used more than 3,000 years ago at the court of the Shang emperors. Wonderful, thank you. Extraordinary. It's such a complete example. I was looking at the shoulder blade of an ox, dated around 1200 BC. Incised on it are characters in a clearly pictographic script. This is an oracle bone, used in pyromancy or divination by fire. Thousands of them have been unearthed, and each is inscribed with one or more questions. And these could range enormously from is the emperor's toothache due to an angry ancestor to will it rain next week? Or perhaps is this a good day to invade our neighbours? Once the question had been written on the bone, you turned it around and made a small pit. A hot poker was then inserted into the pit and the bone would crack. 
and the answer to your question lay in the form of the crack. And in fact, this one has been deciphered. It's asking whether the emperor should muster his army. That much is clear. But because we've lost the art of this particular form of divination, we don't know what the answer was. The reason the inscriptions are often readable is that oracle bone script is clearly the precursor of modern Chinese writing. In the Beijing Huija Private School, Sophia is teaching her six-year-old pupils to read and write. Sophia's main task is to help her pupils memorize hundreds of Chinese characters. To do so, she often starts with the way a character was written 3,000 years ago on oracle bones, where the pictographic nature of Chinese writing is easier to see. At root, like hieroglyphs, Chinese characters are stylized pictures. But the similarities with ancient Egyptian writing do not end there. Professor Yong Shen Chen is a philologist who has studied both writing systems. Egyptian and Chinese writing are very comparable. When I started to learn Egyptian hieroglyphs, I can feel that there's so many similarities. Firstly, the ancient people think to use pictures, but they found pictograms are not enough because there are many abstract concepts and abstract words in language. If you want to record the language fully, pictograms will never succeed. So they think of the method of uh, Rebus, Rebus principle. The Rebus principle is particularly useful in Chinese because the spoken language has many homophones, words that sound the same but have different meanings. For example, mu means tree, but it also means to wash oneself. And so the stylized picture of a tree can represent the word tree, and it can also be used as a so-called phonogram to represent the sound, mu, to wash. But that, of course, could be confusing. Sometimes we don't know uh, what the, uh, the phonograms uh, indicate, that the meaning or the sound, yeah. So they use a uh, determinative. A determinative is a symbol which classifies words into categories and so gives a clue as to the correct way to read a character. These three strokes indicate that the character being written has something to do with water. They can be used to distinguish mu tree from mu to wash, and so clarify the ambiguity inherent in Rebus writing. There are 214 classifier signs, and the majority of Chinese characters are formed using one. Egyptian scribes, too, divided words into categories, and as well as representing words or sounds, many hieroglyphs can also be used as classifiers. For example, you will have a duck. After all the names of birds, you can say a falcon, and then you will have a duck, which means that the falcon belongs to the category of birds. The phonogram classifier combination is a very good way to represent a word. Both Egyptian people and Chinese people believe that's a, like a, a perfect uh, method. Cuneiform 
the writing system of Mesopotamia also made use of classifiers. As did the last great picture-based writing system to be developed in the New World, around 600 BC. Mayan glyphs also depend on the Rebus principle to spell out sounds and use classifiers to sort out the consequent ambiguities. The similarities are striking. If you know a bit about cuneiform and Mayan script and Egyptian script and Chinese script, for example, the main four, you have an inescapable feeling that even though they look completely unrelated, nevertheless, they have many things in common, and this forces you to consider the whole question of origin and spread. So, could there be a common origin of all writing? A single time and place where the secret of turning pictures into words was first discovered. The way I look at it is this. These writing systems have in common the Rebus principle. The Rebus of writing is the, is the written version of, of the pun in speech. And everybody makes puns, and puns are a natural human form of humour. And once you start with the idea of reducing speech to any kind of symbol from which language can be retrieved, then the Rebus thing hits you in the face because when you're casting around for the way to do it, it's obvious, it's just obvious. In other words, the similarities between ancient writing systems reflect not a common origin, but what all people throughout history have always had in common, the human mind. In other words, any load of human beings in any context who have to invent writing will come up with Rebus writings. It's inevitable. At the medieval Round Church in Cambridge, I went to see an event organised by my friend, the calligraphic artist Brody Neuenschwander. He calls it a brush with silence, and it celebrates the diversity of scripts in use around the world. Brush with silence brings calligraphers from about 20 different cultures together. They sit in silence and they write their own scripts. It is a meditation in ink. But a brush with silence presented me with a puzzle. While the Japanese and Chinese calligraphers drew Chinese characters, whose connection with the origin of writing I could see, at every other table, the calligraphers were using scripts which look very different. Instead of thousands of pictograms, they employ just a few dozen simple shapes. These are the world's alphabets. At first glance, alphabets don't seem to have anything to do with the Rebus principle. So what was the connection between the way writing began and the way most people write today. In search of an answer to those questions, I came to the Sinai Desert in Egypt with archaeologist Pierre Talley. Pierre was returning to the plateau of Serebit al Khardim in the company of old friends. With our guide, Salim, we set out to climb 400 meters to the plateau above. We were following a path trod 4,000 years ago by expeditions sent here by the pharaohs of Egypt to mine the gemstone turquoise. This is the real entrance for the place of Serabit el Hadim. You have the main access to the plateau. And you can see on this big face of rock, yeah. plenty of inscriptions and drawings that yeah. have been left by many people trying to commemorate their venue in this place. Arriving in here, yeah. into the place, yeah. And uh, for example, here you have a very skilled inscription yeah. with uh, very nice hieroglyphs. Uh -huh. But of course, everybody was not able to, uh, to write its, its yeah. name. And uh, you have here 
other means to commemorate the, the arrival of somebody. They could left signs, very crude signs like this star that you uh -huh. can see here. You even have a hashtag on the uh, kind of a hashtag, of course, um, <laughs> <laughs> in the big rock that you have that you have behind behind us. The yeah. people are trying to find their own sign to identify themselves. Yeah, of course, and you have in fact uh, uh, literate and illiterate people that are all involved in the same operation. And it's probably the combination of those illiterate and literate people that would produce a new script. We were also following in the footsteps of a famous husband and wife team of archaeologists, William and Hilda Flinders Petrie, who first came here in 1905. At the edge of the plateau, the Petries came across the ruins of an ancient Egyptian temple, dominated by dozens of large stone markers called stelae. The stelae were covered in hieroglyphs that revealed to the Petries why a temple had been built in this remote spot so far from the Nile Valley. This one is one of the best stele that we have in this temple and it is a biography of one official whose name is Orure. He complains at the beginning because he is sent to Sinai not on the good period because it's during the summer and the weather was too hot but at the end it's a perfect story because he is getting more to Koaz than everybody before him and everybody goes safe and sound back <laughs> to, to the Nile Valley. So this is a common type of monument? Yes, we have several monuments of that type. So we have a huge amount of information yeah, about of individuals. About individuals. And uh, we have, in fact, one stila for every mission that was made to Sinai. The turquoise those missions came here to find was an important ingredient in the magic that raised a dead pharaoh to eternal life. And the temple, the Petries learned, was dedicated to Hathor, the goddess of turquoise, so that the miners could invoke her aid. But it was in the mine workings themselves that the Petries made their most surprising discovery. Hilda stepped on a stone and she picked up this stone and told Petrie, there is something here. And this stone in the mine was the first inscription in something very strange that nobody saw ever before. And Petri looked on it and he said, this is not Egyptian. It looks like ugly, very ugly hieroglyphs, but it's not Egyptian. There are too few signs here. This should be an alphabet. And this is the boom. If Petri was right, these would be by far the oldest alphabetic inscriptions ever found. Could this be the first alphabet? And if so, who was responsible for it? Pierre showed me a fascinating clue among the stelae. Ce qui apparaît au bas de cette stèle est vraiment très intéressant puisqu'on y trouve la représentation d'un personnage qui est monté sur un âne. On en voit très 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 bien ici la tête, les oreilles, et ce personnage, ce, cet âne est tenu en laisse par un personnage qui est représenté devant. Et cette image n'est pas du tout l'image d'un Égyptien. Les Égyptiens ne se font pas représenter monté sur des ânes. Il s'agit typiquement de la représentation de quelqu'un qui vient du Negev, quelqu'un qui appartient au monde des Asiatiques, tel que les définissent les Égyptiens. This individual clearly participated in more than one expedition because he's pictured on another stela where the hieroglyphs give us his name. Du frère du prince du Rétenou, un certain Rebded, qui participe à l'expédition pour aider les Égyptiens. Rétenou was an Egyptian name for the biblical land of Canaan. And Canaanite migrant workers may have been a familiar sight in Egypt. These wall paintings decorate a tomb above the Nile in Upper Egypt. They date from the same period as the stelae at Serebet. And one panel shows travelers in the distinctive patterned robes of Canaan, 
which contrast with the simple white loincloths of the Egyptians. The hieroglyphic inscription explains that 37 foreigners came to make offerings to the local ruler, perhaps hoping to be given work. Something similar happened at Serebit, but on the plateau, the cultural exchange between Canaanites and Egyptians seems to have had momentous consequences. Les circonstances sur ce plateau de Serabit el Radim sont très particulières. Nous sommes autour de 1850 avant Jésus-Christ, avec la coexistence régulière de deux communautés différentes. D'une part, les Égyptiens, et de l'autre côté, on a cette petite troupe de gens qui viennent de l'autre côté du Sinaï, du monde asiatique, et qui cohabitent avec les Égyptiens pendant une période prolongée. Et c'est probablement à cette occasion que cette population a eu l'idée de mettre au point ce nouveau système d'écriture en imitant les Égyptiens, mais en adaptant cette écriture à leur propre langue. It seemed that the inscriptions in the mines were related to the hieroglyphs in the temple. But how? Then, another Egyptologist examined an object that Petrie had brought back from Serebit to the British Museum. Thank you, Mark. Really, thank you. Last time that I saw him, he was in a box. Yeah. <laughs> he moved now into a basket. Into a basket yeah. For me, it's worth all the gold of Egypt. This little piece that stays here in the basket. He has a small inscription in Egyptian and a parallel inscription in the strange signs below. So here you have an, an option to break the code. This is why I call him the Rosetta Stone of the alphabet. The code breaker was Sir Alan Gardiner. Gardiner looks on it and it's very easy for him to read the, the Egyptian part. It's a re repetitive formula, hundreds of times in Serbit al Khadim. Says the beloved of the goddess Hatho. And then he looks on the strange signs below. Gardiner guessed that they must spell out a similar dedication in the Canaanite language to a Canaanite goddess. A Canaanite wouldn't call this goddess Hatho. So he wants the name. He wants the name of the goddess because if his theory is correct, he has the beloved of beloved of whom. On the other side of the Sphinx was what looked like a complete inscription. And Gardner was struck by the last symbol. It looked like the letter T in the ancient Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. And that reminded him of a Canaanite goddess known from scripture. In the Bible, we know the god Baal, and he had a consort. The consort in Canaanite is always with a T ending of the female, and she is Baalat. So Gardner guessed that this was what the last four symbols spelled out. The complete name of the Canaanite goddess that he presumed should play the role of Chathor here, Baalat. The name of the goddess was the key to understanding the mysterious Serebit script. The first letter, this rectangle, was clearly based on the Egyptian hieroglyph for house, Per. Egyptian scribes used this symbol in three ways, to write the word house, to represent the sound, Per, and finally, as a classifier attached to any word to do with buildings in general but the Canaanites ignored all these complexities. The great trick, the genius trick, was to take a picture, to read it in its Canaanite's name. The house is Bait in a Canaanite dialect. And then you take only the first sound, the Ba, and whenever you will need a Ba, you draw this house. This is the familiar Rebus principle, but applied in a radically new way. The characters do not stand for the sound of the whole word, but only for the sound at the beginning of the word. And 
this is the great invention. This is the alphabet in th around 30 pictures, 25 to 30 pictures, you can write everything because you are after single sounds that you need. And to write something in this Canaanite dialect, you needed around 30 sounds, that's all. And this was the huge, the, the fantastic invention. Le principe même de l'alphabet, qui est finalement un système d'écriture beaucoup plus simple, et de rend cette écriture bien plus accessible à une plus, un plus grand nombre de gens. Nous sommes au tout début d'un système de démocratisation de l'écriture qui commence ici, à Serabit El Radim, autour de 1850 avant Jésus-Christ. This is it. Yeah, this is it. And maybe you have in front of you one of the first A of the history, just followed by as a, one of the first Bs of the history also. <laughs> Literally alphabets. Literally alphabets. And it is working as an alphabet. Yeah, it is an alphabet. Yeah. They are using hieroglyphic signs, but mm -hmm. in much simpler way. The first B we have. The first B from the whole history. It was truly astonishing to see, scratched nearly 4,000 years ago, a symbol which is the origin of a letter I use every single day. The journey from the mines of Cerebit to the pages of my diary began when Chebded and his followers took their new script back to Canaan, where it was adopted by another Canaanite people, the Phoenicians. Traders and seafarers, they spread the alphabet across the Middle East and the Mediterranean, where it was taken up by Greeks and then Romans. We asked Orly Goldwasser to join calligrapher Brody Neuenschwander to explore the steps that gradually transformed hieroglyphs at Cerebit into the letters we use today. The Canaanites took the hieroglyphs that were meaningful for them, and then they saw the, the head of the bull. They could immediately relate to it because this was the head of their own god, Baal. Aha, okay. But in, in their Semitic dialect, the animal was called Aluf or Alf or Aleph. So they looked at this bull, but they and would say Aluf instead of the yeah, Egyptian word. Yeah, they, they said it in their own language, what right. did they care? And then they decided this will stand for A. So they would make it much simpler than that, I yeah. suppose, just in a couple of strokes right. of the brush, really. Right. Many hundreds of years later, scribes in, in Phoenicia adopt this, uh, this drawing of the bull. They just turn it around because they don't care about the image. And then the, the Romans just change the direction. And you reach your, your A in English and in Latin, and what you have here is actually the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph of the bull sleeping forever in the letter A, because this is just the bull turned on his horns. Do you see? Almost all the letters of the Latin alphabet are ultimately derived from the hieroglyphs that the Canaanites of Cerebit chose to represent the sounds of their tongue. The broken rectangle that was the Egyptian sign for house was abbreviated by the Greeks, flipped by the Romans to create the Latin B. The Egyptian hieroglyph for water, Mayim in the Canaanite tongue, became the Greek Mu and then the Latin M. There were two Egyptian signs which represented snakes. These became the Greek Mu and R-N. So what was the Egyptian word for head? Uh, we don't know exactly, but something like tap top. But it's, it's of no interest for the Canaanite. What is their word for head? Very different. Roche. Roche, with an Roche. R. Yes, with an R at the beginning, and here they will reach the R. So this is the Canaanite. This is the Canaanite head. Yeah. Then the Greeks make again a rather more abstract mm -hmm. representation mm -hmm. of the head here, right. even though you can see the general idea of head. 
The Romans turned everything the other way, systematically. Everything is in the leading direction. But it's been centuries and centuries since we've seen any kind of image in this, and I don't think anybody would know that behind that letter is actually a profile of a head. Yes, again, the Egyptian hieroglyph is hiding in the R. Right. <laughs> They're always hiding. But it's not just Latin and Greek letters that derive from cerebit. Almost all the world alphabets share this same root. Scripts like Hebrew, Armenian, Cyrillic, Tibetan, Devanagari, Gujarati. Sometimes the connection is far from obvious, but it's still there. This document is a leaf from a 7th century Quran dated to 675 CE, the first Islamic century. It represents one of the earliest examples of writing Arabic in a calligraphic style. But when I look at it, I see in these archaic letter shapes the echoes of the alphabet at Sarabit. So for example, if you see this letter here, it looks like a line with a small tail. This is the alif. The first letter, the A. Well, it originally looked a little like a bull, like this. And it gets stylized in Phoenician, simplified to simply this. Now the connection between that and our A in English is quite obvious. Now, one more step takes us to Nabataean Aramaic. Another simplification, it looks simply like a six. And then in the Quran fragment that we looked at, we can see that the loop has almost completely disappeared and we simply have this little tail. And in the modern Arabic script, a straight line. So that straight line through these stages goes all the way back to that bull, even though at different ends they look nothing alike. So the modern Arabic alphabet and the Latin alphabet that we use to write English are our cousins. They belong to the same family. All the alphabets of Arabia, of the Mediterranean, of the Middle East, all of the alphabetic scripts seem to go back to one original prototype. It seems that the alphabet, the concept of writing each phoneme with a separate glyph, that idea, as simple as it is, was only invented once. What Haddad and his followers did in the minds of Cerebit changed the world. They were not scribes or scholars, but when they adapted the Rebus principle, which was the basis of all ancient scripts, to make the first letters, they created a form of communication which would eventually sweep the globe. We owe to those illiterate migrant workers the invention of the alphabet. A simple script which gave the gift of writing to countless cultures, uniting the peoples of the world across space and time.